a game changer and has revolutionized education. I now hand over the stage to Swamiji. Uh, thank you, Minimum. Thank you for the wonderful introduction of all the speakers here today. I think uh, today is a wonderful evening and we already had one uh, dynamic words of exchange in the last webinar, way, uh, I think in, on, on 16th of January. So we have been contemplating on how uh, we can bring in more and more insights into this NEP. Uh, NEP being introduced on the right time because, and the, today's discussion topic is uh, classroom dynamics. And I strongly believe that most of the teachers have been seeing the classroom for the past one year because of the, the pandemic and we are, we are completely shifting to a totally different platform we call as online pl platform. And that said, I feel being a teacher, the, the emotional connect or the face-to-face -face interaction, the impact of face-to-face -face interaction has more and more, more importance. It is not just in uh, teaching, but also in building the life of a student or changing the perspective of the student from totally different dimension so that a teacher alone can understand. So we, we have already seen the, the, the paradigm shift moving from the classroom teaching to online. And uh, I'm sure that the teachers became the problem solvers for the past one year, finding out the best laptop, best connectivity, uh, best platform for online teaching, best online uh, examination platform. So we are all now problem solvers. So given that situation, uh, the, the first, first question to all the three panelists here. So what I, I wanted to understand and uh, I wanted the participants also to understand, what is your perspective? When, when the national education policy is talking about diversity, uh, about the change in the type of learning, and we saw that the CBSE has already introduced 10% of the questions as analytical questions, and they are thinking from a totally different perspective. Maybe in the standards of the US, uh, we see that the JEE mains is conducted four times and the students can keep uh, uh, attempting one, uh, uh, you know, several times and will take the best score. So given the situation, maybe in the next uh, couple of years time, when, when we all go back to the schools and classrooms, what is it that you see in the change in the classroom dynamics and how will the shift, the current shift impact or how the teachers shall be prepared to welcome the new novel? So my first question uh, the, goes to uh, Ritu ma'am. Please ma'am. Uh, thank you so much Swamiji. And I would uh, like to discuss uh, that NEP has brought a lot of uh, enthusiasm among uh, the teaching faculty because uh, we feel that for so long we were doing so many things, but uh, the output was not shown as it should have been. So we want now the output should be seen uh, because this, uh, the dynamics outside, uh, the classrooms are changing so fast. There are new jobs. We never heard about artificial intelligence coming uh, in such a uh, affluent way. We didn't hear about data science, machine learning. These things came up so fast in the outside world that the classroom had to be changed with the teaching learning process. So children should be given flexibility. The very good thing which I can think about uh, the new education policy is that the word uh, child-centric and flexible. These two words have given a lot of freedoms in the class. The classrooms will be more vibrant, will be interactive, will be collaborative. So children will learn with their own pace of learning. It won't be like rote learning, forcing things on them, uh, pressurizing for marks. Of course, uh, in India, because there's a lot of competition, marks at the end of the learning is important. But as you just now said that uh, the um, exams which are coming up, they are giving multiple opportunities. JE is giving multiple opportunities. Improve yourself, improve your score. One exam of three hours, how can that define the capability of a child? It cannot be an end to his career, to his dreams, to his uh, whatever he has worked throughout. It cannot be an end. 
So I think now with this multiple exam system, multiple taking exams, coming to formative assessments, back again to formative assessments, these things will help uh, the, to evolve the teaching learning process in a great way. And we have the support of CBSE, we have support of now MHRD and so many learned people understanding NCRT itself is evolving into the text and curriculum so much that we are now, we will be seeing the new children, the new pass outs from our schools with more confidence, more, uh, I can say when you, when you don't have dimensions, when no boundaries are made, that no, you are a humanity student, you can take this, you are a science student, you can do this. How can you limit the thought of a child? The first artificial intelligence introduced by CBSE gave such a, uh, you can say, flexibility that even a humanity student was going. He did a project in my artificial intelligence class. He was more excited. The project was won by commerce students. So there is nothing we can talk about. Only science can students can do this. Coding cannot be done by our humanities. Why can't? Coding is a something which is application of mind. So this is giving a lot of enthusiasm for teachers also and for learners also. So uh, the classroom uh, dynamics is tot totally changing and we are happy about this policy. So uh, ma'am, uh, just a small a small uh, question add, adding to this. Do you think that the technology will rule uh, the, the teaching community, teaching fraternity? Technology can never rule. Technology is always a tool. Black, blackboard were also tools. They were also tools. Teachers were teaching. We used to take maps. We used to take uh, these uh, codes with uh, various uh, this thing diagrams. Uh, periodic table. Initially, when I started, I used to take periodic table to the class, and that roller, the big roller was there, and you are explaining from there. That is nothing. So technology is like a tool. It makes you more interactive. It gives you a lot of ways to collect the data on a click of a button i can give so much to my child but i am the facilitator to collect the information to give that clue to the child here it is now you explore from here so i am helping him i am not forcing him or i am not a, a teacher who is there just to give lecture and i am with the, the child so technology can never take over it is a great tool lot of things we did in this pandemic. Our school, our teachers explored so much that the classrooms became so lively. So it is an added advantage to have good tools with us and teachers are using it very promptly and they can never replace, technology can never replace teachers. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for the, that, uh, that the keyword which you mentioned, technology is a tool. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, now let me let me ask uh, the uh, let me bring the baton to uh, Devani, ma'am, uh, asking you how how do you think that the the how many teachers what percentage of teachers will take this uh, the uh, the change in the classroom dynamics by integrating technology as a tool in in the teaching learning process and what is your take on how they should embrace the change. Thank you, uh, Swamiji. Now, um, I would just go a little back and look at the 21st century. Now, 21st century inaugurated a period which is abandonment of textbook-driven, teacher-driven, or uh, the curriculum-driven uh, uh, education. Now, uh, all this had an impact on our functioning of the schools, our functioning of the classrooms, the pandemic uh, and the new education policy, I would say they came at a time where a uh, pandemic expedited what was already happening uh, in the education sector. Now, when you look at the definitely this whole uh, dynamics of the 21st century classroom rest and would rest a lot on technology. Of course, as ma'am said, technology cannot replace the teachers. It is just an enabler. But this, the scenario is that the concept of schooling changes from the building 
to a nerve center which is porous transparent where teachers are sitting somewhere the students are somewhere else the uh, information is being uh, churned from the, a third place so technology number one definitely will be the order of the uh, 21st century classrooms also the educators need to keep this in mind that an nep has uh, very vociferously talked about flexibility which ma'am uh, mentioned flexibility is essential to a 21st century classroom also now the educators have to understand that this flexibility has to be student centered in terms of the way teaching learning process has to happen so there has to be adopt and adapt and also get into the mold where one side does not fit all so an orange is not equal to an apple so teachers have to take recourse number one of the technology you know but two they have to uh, get on to the differential teaching learning uh, techniques finally making learning very relevant because the 21st century rel uh, a student is not a student who the knowledge who doesn't come to school just for the sake of information or knowledge so therein the teacher the curriculum uh, has to align learning with the real life uh, situation with the real life and have to create a connect between the learner and the curriculum so definitely the, the third thing is that the pedagogy will no more be the linear transaction it would be a circular it would be a dynamic it there will be a sum total of multiple elements which will create a wholesome uh, dynamic uh, classroom and this change is very beautiful and we all hope that the teachers imbibe and yes technology teachers will have to get into the shoes of technology thank you sir thank you thank you devani ma'am uh, i think uh, uh, kanika ma'am are, are you there i'm there i'm there yeah yes ma'am yeah, what is your view on the changing dynamics of uh, in the classroom uh, so one more, i i'll just add to it uh, see when you when you talk about online classes uh, generally we have seen in almost all the Uh, online uh, you know the portals is that you you see the word instructor there is no teacher there is instructor so when 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 we come to come to technology and when we try to bring in technology in the classroom uh, how how do they uh, the teachers maintain the same exactly the same way of teaching combined with technology and when we roll out this nep 2020 uh, how far do you think that technology will impact the classroom dynamics right thank you for that question uh at the outset i would like to uh, point out a couple of things about nep those, those are my personal views on nep uh, yes uh, a i feel uh, nep is actually just a vision at the moment and uh, unfortunately i feel there is no manual that has been developed to implement this vision as a vision most visions are beautiful where we have this picture perfect situation in a classroom where the children are full of uh, beans and they are enthusiastic full of energy uh, well looked after well fed on nutritional midday meals and uh, the the teacher is actually a uh, an embodiment of patience and love and affection and she's a, a leader of her own subject and she's capable of uh, bringing in together you know experiential and immersive and uh, uh, compassionate empathetic uh, learning uh, now as i said that is why i think as a vision it's beautiful but then how does one teacher in that classroom implement it i mean that is taking a uh, uh, you know uh, it's a very very uh, tall order on the teacher and uh, so the classroom is very very dynamic as per 
you know, uh, the dynamics uh, of a classroom go. But then the, I, uh, the issue is of, you know, how to implement it. And B, your uh, question regarding, uh, you know, teacher as instructor uh, and whether we will be able to do the same thing. Now, uh, here, uh, Chaitanya Ji, I feel that if you are going to do the same thing, then why have technology? And my issue with the teacher is that, that if I am going to replicate, duplicate what I was doing in the classroom, it's just that the platform has changed. It's just that the physical environment has changed where I'm uh, in the school or in my, uh, you know, at home. And the child is at home in uh, sitting in his bed or uh, at the table. And yet we have a very meaningful uh, transaction. Uh, and yet we continue to use the same pedagogy as earlier, the same style. That is a problem because technology has to be an enabler, an enabler for the teacher. As uh, it has been said earlier by the other uh, panelists, technology is just a tool. But yes, but that tool cannot be, now chalk and duster is, uh, are not the same tool as technology. So I cannot expect to use or teach in the same way as I was doing with the chalk and duster. I have to adapt, I have to change, I have to evolve. And that is where the challenge lies. And that is what I think we need to focus on. We should not look for, uh, no, constantly I have this problem when people talk about going back to the normal. Now, uh, what is this normal? Who decided on this normal? What were the parameters uh, that were taken into consideration? Why uh, that this should be the normal? So uh, somewhere we have to redefine that. And on one hand, I think there is a bit of a, a contradiction that on one hand, we talk about flexibility, allowing a lot of flexibility to the student. Uh, we cannot allow flexibility to the student without allowing flexibility to the teacher there. And there in any, any kind of a situation, there has to be a structure. Uh, you talked about, uh, you know, uh, multiple uh, attempts at, uh, uh, JE. I have, I feel that, yes, that's a very good thing that, uh, you know, one exam should not decide on the capability of the exam, of the candidate. But at the same time, uh, and, and uh, you see, when I'm trying to uh, do something once, twice, thrice, and again, the fourth time, does it give me any message? I think there is a big message in that. So is that going to actually uh, uh, increase the stress? My own self-image? My own self-esteem? So these are so many questions uh, that come up in my head when I think in terms of the changing dynamics that uh, we are uh, looking at it in a, in a very uh, constricted manner and not looking at the you know the, the the you know the impact on the recipients or the stakeholders of this entire exercise called education i think i have uh, said too much in too little uh, no, no no ma'am uh, as you rightly pointed out uh, see this is this being a vision document uh, i think that there is a lot of uh, deliberation and discussions and a lot of uh, kind of contemplation required on how to implement this because the Indian education system across the states, uh, across the cities and villages are far, far different from what we see. So taking it to, to that level, I think it is totally difficult, very difficult, very challenging, unless otherwise you have the methods in which we need to practice this uh, NEP on, on place and as, as part of the system. And as you said, the, the flexibility part, we are more concerned or we have to be more concerned about the teachers because teachers are considered as the assets for the school. And teachers needs to be, they should get support. Uh, otherwise, they will not be able to mold the, mold the future generation. So as you rightly pointed out, we have to focus on or we have to see on how far this is practical. 
the the policies laid down and being a, uh, a technological enthusiast and a computer science teacher i strongly believe that technology can never replace teaching it is impossible but as you as we all agree a technology can be a tool a, a tool to support the teacher in learning more and more on total different methodologies on how they can we can deliver the 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 content or the stuff in, a, in the most effective way and especially when we when we see this the current situation the change in which we were able to accept forcefully and that is very important and that has changed our even our mindset and we are now in a in a uh, situation in a stage where we are ready to embrace the change if it is for good if it is as you said if it is for to for, to evolve so i think uh, maybe it will take so much of time and that is why the whole uh, series of webinars we have planned on deliberating on how to resolve the issues uh, bring up the points faced by the teachers and the principals let us discuss and let us come uh, come with you know uh, effective solutions and try to implement this so that's it uh, let me let me move to the the uh, core section uh, my first question uh, will be to uh, uh, ritu ma'am uh, the most important and the, what i believe is uh, something that will define the future of the st uh, students um, again i will come back to the je mains why i i am state, stating the je mains again a, and again is that i have seen a drastic increase in the number of students registering for the exam and almost like you know uh, 50 per, maybe 30 to 35 percent of the students uh, there has been an increase and that that must percentage and i see that uh, uh, states like up andhra pradesh telangana and gujarat uh, have seen a rise in the the number of students registering for this and it is primarily when i when i inquired about it it is primarily because of the regional language so that come uh, when you when you come to the regional language promoting the native language and there has been uh, definitely there has been resistance uh, because when we when we talk about writing a statement of purpose or writing a letter of uh, letter requesting for admission in the foreign university so how is it possible that a student or a teacher or the entire change of this uh, the the uh, the multilingual teaching how is it possible that we can bring in such a change in in the in the classroom uh this is a great challenge the multilingual approach and especially the native language which we are talking about in nep that introduction of the learning through native language in the pre primary and primary classes it is a very very great challenge uh see there are expectations of, from of parents from schools when we talk about parents sending to public schools and all the other schools which are uh, international schools and all uh, the primary focus is that the child should speak well in english he should be able to write uh, 90% of the material which we search on that and we get uh, in international uh, context also is also uh, in english language so when we say that you start studying in your uh, native language and in the in northern states in most of the states when we take talk about hindi being language the child will grasp the concept very well it is very well uh, taken by the child because he is more comfortable at home uh, many parents grandparents still are talking in the native language so the child absorbs it very well but it's a big challenge the classroom cannot have dual language system the teaching uh, by a teacher and uh, how well she is versed with both languages is very difficult to understand so a lot of training has to be done a lot of thought process has to go we have to see the output what will be the output so we have to make our rubrics tools of assessments in that manner that we understand which has given us better results and this can be only tested in the primary section pre primary where we have lot of time we are not time bound with lot of uh, lesson uh the curriculum being finished in a particular day but as you said about senior classes when you say that j exams are done in local language uh, even neat exam this time they had uh, given an option of um, all uh, traditional language there was urdu there was another languages so uh, child children must have done very well because 
they were able to understand the question well. It's not about uh, how you reproduce. If you understand the question, your answering becomes very easy. So that has helped many children and it's a great move uh, that we are giving them that flexibility of language. But teaching in classroom, how effective it will be uh, by the teacher who is so good in both languages has to be questioned, training has to be done, a lot of output has to be seen, measured, and then only we can take this forward. I feel that. Uh, but ma'am, uh, let me let me little contradict with your uh, with your opinion. It's not actually a contradiction, but uh, let me put in your different way. Uh, see, for example, I am I am a teacher in the university, uh, and I am in the south. Okay, so let us say somebody from UP or from the North Belt come uh, attending JE mains in Hindi uh, comes to the south or in any other state. Let us say any other state. How far will he will be able to? Uh, you know, grasp the topics if the topics are taught in English. And let us assume that he is planning to go abroad. And what will be the challenge in challenges faced by the student from the student perspective? Will that help him or is it a disadvantage? See, English is always a uh, easy way because most of the people are understanding this language. So if you talk about any other language, how the child will be able to take, it is great difficulty. I was in South, it was so difficult for me even to talk to many people because there were 20 languages spoken in Bangalore itself and you can't master 20 languages so much coming from North. Uh, so I cannot say that it will be so easy, but of course the challenge is there. Even though people, Chinese and Japanese, when uh, Japan students from Japan go to US and study, they, it is a challenge for them. They have studied most of the texts in Japanese. In China, most of the texts in schools I have seen is all in Chinese. But when they go to US for higher studies, they adapt to English. So it is a struggle to adapt, but they have to adapt to the change. So students are, uh, uh, I must say, this generation is so flexible and understanding things. They are so fast in learning. So there is a challenge and we have to see that how we bring about this change so that it is not a pressure again. It should not be a pressure. It should be something which is giving them an ease to uh, and empower them to do well in life. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, but I, I still believe that uh, there is a lot to go, uh, especially yes. when we say that, you know, the change in the, uh, the language being taught or the exams they, uh, they conducted in the regional languages and how it will reflect in the future of the child. That is still a question mark from uh, my own perspective. But let us hope that the change will create some, uh, some you know, uh, uh, changes in the in the system itself. So coming back to uh, Devani, ma'am, uh, see, uh, we we are uh, now in a situation where uh, the 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 teachers themselves become the problem solvers. Now, uh, we know that the kids are so smarter than teachers, and they they have uh, grasping much much more grasping power than the teachers. What what we learn in hours. They might, take, uh, they might learn in maybe few minutes. So that is how the way in which they use the smartphone. And uh, mm -hmm. when, we, when we talk about the learning process, so far the, the way in which the questions were asked, the questions asked were totally in a different format and now it is changing. And we, we, talk, uh, we talk, we hear uh, much, much more about experiential learning, problem solving, critical thinking. And uh, uh, we, are, we are aiming to move from uh, at uh, rote lo learning to or rote memorization to uh, practical applications uh, so that they understand they are able to relate the concept with the real time uh, real time application so how is it that uh, you how do you think that the the uh, the change bringing uh, or implementation of nep and uh, reducing the syllabus uh, how do you think that this kind of learning the new methodology of learning can be incorporated uh, in the curriculum as well as in the classroom Thank you, uh, Chaitanya ji. Now, uh, first of all, I would uh, like to uh, bring home the fact that a basic understanding of rote learning, which has been uh, across, prevalent across the world, it is something which we as a system uh, incorporated, right? And uh, memorization, and reproducing. 
sadly our system did not test our intelligence it used to test only the uh, memory so generations and generations were conditioned to this kind of a system now uh, when you talk about critical thinking which is one of the key skills of 21st century which all the uh, educational documents lay emphasis on which we feel that this is uh, i wouldn't say it is the need of the art today critical thinking is a skill which is which is there in each human being and which needs to be honed in each human being now because of the heavy curriculum the and because of our a uh, desire to have a kind of students we got on to memorization recall and reproduction now when we come to uh, critical thinking we i the only word that comes to my mind is from rote learning to a meaningful learning approach now how do we create that meaningful learning approach first of all let me just uh, talk a little bit about the critical thinking now critical thinking is uh, the only toolkit for problem solving and problem solving then is the biggest biggest life skill at each point we face problems and we need to troubleshoot them secondly i feel that there is no approach as such but such skills need to be honed and fostered in uh, students from a very very elementary stage so instead of uh, asking your students to mug up and reproduce the emphasis on this the emphasis should be on deriving meaningful connections in learning trying to create a pedagogical approach where the child learns from near to far where the child creates integrated connections in uh, learning further reasoning has to be inculcated so when you inculcate these basic skills it's not about how i am going to teach what uh, what i teach it is about that what skills i am imparting my student so child needs to understand the skills needs to be fostered where the child makes informed decision where he is able to uh, develop in him the art of discernment where he is able to recognize and understand that there can be four different perspectives when we look at one situation so these are some of the uh, skills that a 21st century educator has to now uh, cbsc and all the policy they have tried to reduce the syllabus the curriculum only because there was so much of talk and buzz about that the educators are under a lot of pressure to complete the syllabus and hence the traditional chop and talk hence the uh, the information just was just passed there was no teaching that was actually happening now uh, when i come to how this uh, can be integrated so first of all the educators in the classroom have to create meaningful learning experiences for the child in the for each child as i earlier said that an orange is not equal to an apple so there has to be multiple techniques to taking a concept in the class but what really happens is the teacher walks in the class opens the book and for from 12 eight topics are taught in a way where the knowledge the information is just passed up the educator has to take each concept and look at how the various pieces fit together so if you are teaching water you need to not just look at the 
ecological phenomena, rain, uh, condensation, vaporization, you also need to tell, the, uh, make the child understand the problems related to water, the scarcity, the water management. But that requires spending considerable time on a concept. So again, as uh, Kanika Ji was talking about, are the educators, they need to be empowered and conditioned in a way that they wean out uh, from, they are made to wean out from the traditional passing of knowledge to taking up each concept and looking at the needs of each child. Further, assessment becomes very important. When you, uh, so assessment, not just one window assessment to test that assessment, continuous assessment, an ongoing assessment through synthesis, evaluation, and argumentation. So the child's perspective, the children and all of us have been conditioned with education is all about a right and a wrong answer. So we forget building a perspective. Again, tools of assessment become exceptionally important that how are you framing your questions? Are you basing them on the knowledge? Are you having multiple windows of assessment? So all these have to, and if CBSC has reduced the uh, syllabus, it is only because it wants a smooth, seamless transition from the memorization, recalling and reproduction to a more higher order thinking skills uh, based pedagogical approach. So uh, another thing I would say is that there is no harm in memorization because memorization finally creates an edifice on which uh, of knowledge on which your higher order thinking skills are created. So yes, I think it has to be an interplay of memorization, but yes, critical thinking, which becomes the key to problem solving has to be uh, the main idea behind pedagogical uh, changes that are happening. Uh, okay, ma'am. So uh, you think that uh, the change in the or the implementation of NAP, uh, if it is placed in a proper way across the educators, uh, and when we uh, when we make sure that it, even the teachers are able to come up with proper assignments, evaluation systems. Uh, then we can we can definitely implement the the concept of critical thinking, uh, you know, removing the the kind of rote learning systems. Uh, do you think that it is how how far it will take, or what will be the the time uh, gap that will the, 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 in the shift? This is a seriously a very tough question because NEP is a very very beautiful document. It is futuristic. It is such an evolved document. But whenever there is a talk about its implementation, so the uh, educators have to change their mindset. Educators have to come out. So I think it will take a very long time. Uh, and a lot has to be done. More than educating the, uh, the learner and the students, we all need to uh, work, uh, co-create and co-work with the educators to create that shift in their mindset that, uh, you know, most of the time I remember in the social science classes, I see that teachers making student mark that the answer is from here to here. And when the child would write his own perspective, the teachers will often not accept. So that is where the child is threatened to exhibit his own perspective. So that shift the teachers have to learn more in this case, man. But yes, the implementation will be a big challenge. But um, this is a very, very welcoming and, as I said, futuristic uh, document. And we need to work a lot towards the teacher empowerment for uh, the effective implementation of the policy. OK, uh, thank you, ma'am. Before uh, shooting my next question to Kanika, mm -hmm. ma'am, I, I think uh, she has uh, a better answer for my previous question to Devani ma'am, because I could make out from her smile. <laughs> Please ma'am. 
Uh, yeah, I just want to add on to a few things uh, that Devyani has said. Um, I think the first thing is that we have to get rid of the term syllabus and we have to get used to a curriculum. And very seldom do we uh, realize the difference. I think even the educators very seldom do reflect on the difference between curriculum and uh, syllabus. And uh, CBSE talking about reducing the syllabus actually doesn't help much. We have to prescribe a curriculum and then leave it, give the flexibility to the teacher to uh, take this forward in his or her class as per the need of that group, as per the need of that uh, demographic uh, location of that school. And then the, let the question, even if it is a standardized exam, let it be conceptual, then it is free from uh, the local dimension. But it is a concept that is being tested, if we have to test. That is one thing that I want to, uh, uh, I feel very strongly about, that uh, somewhere uh, we are too uh, tied to the syllabus. I mean, how do you decide what the example that she shared, which is very much uh, part of the SDG goals, that uh, yes, we have to bring in sustainable development goals everywhere that we are, you know, uh, whenever we are uh, uh, into the classroom transaction. So therefore, uh, that, that can only happen, or even if things like gender sensitization or um, you know, equality, equity, honesty, integrity, uh, life skills. Uh, so all these can only be incorporated if we rid ourselves of a syllabus because no syllabus can be comprehensive enough to include these things. You really can't write a textbook on this. That is the human element there. You cannot create a, um, an app for that. That is where the human intervention comes in. That's where the transaction of the instructor, as you said in the beginning, yes, and the instructor has to be uh, uh, replaced by the facilitator. I mean, that is a very uh, fashionable term to use, but have we been really facilitators in, uh, in spirit? And uh, it is not easy to uh, give up this, position of power, I feel. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, unfortunately, and we have been continuing like this for generations. Yes. And uh, that is a very, very important thing. And therefore, when we talk about teacher uh, empowerment, teacher retraining and uh, uh, reworking on the educator, as Devyani said a little earlier, yes, it is not uh, the students. We have to begin with the teacher first then it requires a complete revamp of the teacher herself. When we talk about experiential learning, and I say, okay, this is where the, uh, the wheat the, uh, for your chapati comes from. As a teacher, have I ever been uh, out in a farm? Do I know what uh, the wheat crop looks like? If I have not sensed it, if I have not felt it, I will never be able to bring it to the class. No amount of YouTube can equal that uh, experience of being really in a farm and actually you know, growing my own food. So I feel all these things that we have listed out as the syllabus for uh, the children should be the curriculum of all teacher training institutions first. Okay, uh, thank you, ma'am. So I'll just connect the whatever you discuss now. I will connect this with the next question. Uh, so that said, uh, we all believe that, uh, and as you emphasize that, the the NEP twenty twenty is still a vision, vision, and it's an only visionary document. Uh, I have two two parts for you. Uh, one is one is that how how do you think that the change in the the classroom environment will go for the next maybe five years time in the in given the current situation and what is your perspective will the change be in the in the perspective which you think personally or will there be a difference okay uh, the first question first i feel uh, 
there is going to be a lot of confusion for the coming one year at least till things settle down uh, it is like a, a transition that we had uh, in march last year you know when everybody was thrown into the situation and then we had to uh, equip ourselves uh, to find platforms to interact with uh, the students and to you know bring them back to the classroom so there was a lot of hand holding lot of learning a lot of exploration now that exploration has probably happened and uh, i think there's an addiction in everything now it has also reached something that we complained about uh, regarding our students i think there has been uh, it has become quite addictive for the facilitator also uh, so and it has become addictive for the parent also uh so it is not just uh, it has become addictive for the uh, uh, the heads of schools also now, as a vice principal i have so much of uh, access to the classroom of my teachers in a way that i never had it earlier so it is it is definitely something which i would like to uh, enjoy in the sense because i have instant feedback so that's why i said when physically also or when we come back in the flipped or the blended mode uh this uh, uh there is going to be some amount of confusion because a there are going to be children with all different abilities and uh there are children who require the human touch much more than others those are not self motivated children very few of them are self motivated and three because this kind of a blended system will depend heavily on a uh, data analysis and are we equipped as teachers to interpret handle data technology might help me to collect that data but am i in a position to create uh, assignments which are in alignment with that the data that i have received and as i said at the beginning uh, chetanya ji that you know i as a teacher i'm expected to be capable of doing everything and uh, i might be a wonderful teacher in the classroom very empathetic very compassionate but i may not be as adept at uh, setting uh, a very challenging question paper or a concept uh, checking question paper that may not be my forte and i have not received any training in that so this year i feel the or the next 5 years are going to be devoted uh, for schools to take a call on empowerment of teachers and how they want to rework the um, uh, you know the responsibilities of the teacher they want the teacher to continue to uh, perform a lot of clerical jobs if they are then of course it is ultimately those 24 hours that the teacher has the quality is going to suffer and the parent is going to be in your uh, classroom all the time so the teacher has no choice but willingly uh, change the language of a transaction i just want to share one example if i have your permission uh the other day uh, this was one of those very young classes that happened to be in and um, the teacher sensed my presence probably and the question that was put to this little one was uh 3 and 8 uh will give you 11 after using which operation now the child was foxed uh and uh i was really really upset about this actually speaking but i didn't want to butt in uh if that was not the right thing to do but what i'm trying to say is am i trying to impress uh my senior am i trying to impress the parent or the grandparent sitting there or am i trying to reach the child so sudden somewhere my priorities have all got mixed up which was not there in the classroom when the transaction was between me and my child so these are the various uh, which i think no document can actually document these issues these are the issues that we will have to sort out uh, at our own local level and uh, so therefore 
next five years, I see that a lot of experimentation, a lot of back and forth that is going to be happening. It's not going to be one streamlined, settled system like we have been used to, where everybody does that rote learning, appears for an exam, moves on to the next level. Learning is not um, challenged. Knowledge is. Okay, uh, thank you, ma'am. In fact, I have uh, two things to uh, from your answers. Uh, I don't, I don't think that we have enough time to discuss about that. But I'll just mention my my concerns. Uh, concerns. It's not really concern, but uh, and I really appreciate the way in which you have put forth uh, about the data analytics skill skill the, the data uh, of data analytics required for teachers. In fact, I'm planning to do a webinar for on that alone. <laughs> Because that is one of the the biggest skills that will uh, that will be required for the entire teaching community. Without that, I don't think that technology can be taken as a tool. Otherwise, uh, as you said, the teachers will will uh, be completely immersed in the ugly administrative job, and of course, uh, people like you as vice principals and principals. And another uh, thing I wanted to bring to your notice is when you talk about the moving from syllabus to curriculum. And uh, ensuring that you you have a topic, and the topic can be defined, or the or the subtopics can be defined by a teacher. That is what a curriculum means, right? So how do you think that the the balancing of across the country on that topic for a for a class for for a subject? How far do you think you can balance that at the same level? Because I have seen uh, when when I used to teach. We also have three to four campuses, and I used to teach from one campus. So there were experts or better teachers than me, and I had always struggled to reach at that level because the question paper was to be one one question paper, and the the questions asked were in such a way that all of the questions were mostly kind of analytical questions. So I had to end up preparing analytical questions, and I had to struggle a lot. So reaching to that level. How far is it possible, or what is the kind of change that is required from a teacher's perspective? Right, that's uh, I just love that question. Uh, I feel, uh, as I said a little earlier, uh, we have to relook teacher uh, training, and we uh, it is like I said, you know, uh, it may not be a forte of the same teacher to have these five different capabilities. There might be some, those are born teachers, but there are others who are not. They have to be trained to become teachers. And so maybe we can have a system where we can subject experts actually delivering the content. And we can have another set of uh, people, educators, who are actually in our everyday life. Uh, I mean, I'm not talking about a standardized exam. I'm talking about even in a classroom uh, where another teacher whose uh, skill lies in setting uh, concept-based analytical questions. And that can be divided. I mean, why do we look at the teacher as one compact composite whole to be able to do everything? And here, we, it's like, uh, I will take an analogy from, say, medicine. There is this MBBS doctor who can go till that much to give a, a full perspective on the ailment or the issues or the concerns. Ultimately, you have to go to a specialist when the problem has been identified. So also, I mean, if, if there is a, a, a learning challenge, I have to have another person stepping in to handle that learning challenge. I mean, it is all very well to say that we have special educators, but is a special educator also who is uh, adept at handling visually challenged students is going to be equally adept at uh, handling somebody with Down syndrome? Because uh, the canons are going to be very different. The tools are going to be very different. The mind mapping is going to be very different. I mean, for another child, I can have, you know, uh, different colors and uh, draw certain uh, flow charts and all that uh, for an ADHD child. But I cannot do that for a visually challenged 
the child. So I have a different uh, frame of mind, a different mindset, a different focus. So we need to have greater focus on skills. And I think maybe we'll have to do this uh, like a, a bridge period until this gap is bridged. And trained teachers, the, uh, the current set of teachers need to be, uh, of course, taking the lead. And uh, again, uh, if you could repeat that uh, second half of your question, uh, it just missed me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, my question was exactly, uh, see, when you, when you talk about the curriculum and syllabus, uh, that is, the, that is the one of the best ways to uh, to uh, improve the entire education system. Right, 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 right. Okay, because yes, you talked about uh, what yeah. happens to the sub uh, topics, yes, right? Yes, 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 how to become a uniform education. So how do you manage yeah. the, the country? Right. So that I feel that we have to have a very, very uh, solid audit system. There is no audit in education, unfortunately, and whatever is there is just uh, on paper. So if we have to have a proper audit, uh, it's just like that, you know, a lesson plan goes to the next level, to the subject coordinator or the head of the department until it is approved by her or the next uh, principal or the vice principal, whatever the hierarchy or school is following. So we can have that same thing. It could actually be audited by these bodies, accredited bodies to see that the curriculum uh, takes has taken care of certain uh, outputs that we desire uh, to arrive at through these uh, this entire uh, curriculum transaction. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so uh, let me let me apologize for keeping uh, Ritu, ma'am, waiting in the in the loop. And uh, I just wanted to bring in, uh, ma'am, uh, when we talk about experiential learning. Uh, we have, I think we have discussed a lot about experiential learning, but on the other hand, uh, so I don't want to pose a direct question, rather I want to give a challenging question. On the other hand, we see that a lot of companies like Baidu's are coming up with app. So you have a mobile application, you have a tablet and uh, the parents believe that we can just learn, the students, their children can just learn with the help of animation. And how do you differentiate between between the the application based learning uh, with animation kind of thing and gamification and how do you differentiate that with the experiential learning that is envisaged by the government uh, in in the new education policy um, see both are very very effective and both are very good uh, we cannot say animations uh, are not important or gamifications are not important. Today's generation is uh, uh, gamification friendly. We can say the, the Toycathon, which has come, the new initiative by the government for Toycathon, is because they know that children are playing games and they are, why not involve them into something very constructive? So I have seen my children have made a beautiful game, how to learn valency, how to learn the various balancing of reactions by certain games. So uh, if children can design such good gamification themselves, and that can be used by another person who is not very good at making games, but has learned the concept so well, why not use it? So till now, Teachers were doing experiential learning, taking them out, taking them beyond classrooms, showing them the reality. But uh, sometimes physically it is not possible. You cannot show if you want to take a, if you want to show a creator or something, or uh, you want to show uh, a basic structure inside uh, something which is dangerous. You cannot touch it, and you cannot go to that particular location. It is not that you cannot teach. You have to teach. So the experiential learning was one method where many people have used it, even in villages, teachers I saw, I observed some classes and even in villages, teachers used to take them out and show them a very good way of uh, dissemination of lecture in the outskirts, uh, uh, beyond the classroom boundaries. But when this generation, our, our generation is so much tech savvy, 
and they can design themselves that if a teacher has used those methods of uh, gamification or of uh, something where uh, animation is required, then why not? Uh, I used to feel when I used to teach chemistry, there were certain topics in uh, benzene resonance, how the electron has moved from one place to the other. I cannot do it experientially. I could have not done it with the simple uh, teaching aids. Now, when I show that resonance or I show that um, process in uh, animation, it is so clear. So Baiju's is not that everything. Baiju's is not everything that, oh, leave classroom teaching, leave regular and go to Baiju's and use that app. But I have seen children who used to hate mathematics, who were scared of mathematics. There was a little scare in them, have started enjoying mathematics. So we have to draw, a, a, you can say, a, a place where we have to tell a child that the concept has to be taken, but concept cannot be gone into that dimension that you are wasting time. So time, because when you get engrossed in that, you forget your time and uh, you keep, you have not uh, put your things in the right place that, oh, I wanted to finish this today, but you have gone beyond. Then you are panicky at the end. Oh, I wanted to finish this, but I have not done my particular portion. I went into depth to one topic. So that should not be there. Children should be trained how to use it. Even teachers should take this and help in the classroom that how much you have to go. But I have not seen anything wrong in Baidu's app, anything, uh, concept cannot be learned, but it cannot only be learned by an app or this thing. It has to be supplemented by classroom teaching. It has to be supplemented by a subject expert. That ex subject expert can be teacher, that subject expert can be parent, and it can be a peer. Why not another peer can be also a subject expert who's learned the concept better. So children will have now various dimensions of learning. It will not be only through classroom a teacher is doing a child peer approach of learning. Even teachers are learning from peer group. I saw this time all the teachers who were about to retire uh, and we never thought that they will adopt to technology so far as saying that it is my last year or a year is left. They adapted to technology learning so fast. They used to learn from children. They used to learn from other teachers and their classroom when I used to observe, I used to feel that at that age, they have become so smart and they are doing uh, teaching. Economics class was so interesting with the teacher who was about to retire this year. So when at that age, it, it is an induction where the teacher feels that I should learn, I should be able to handle. And we are allowing children not to use it. It is, it is sad that we have to tell children, please use it, but in a way where it is helpful, how much you can implement it, how much time you should spend on it, and you should look to some other ways also. So it, you cannot divide the two, it has to be added as a cohesion and learn, make learning more interesting and fun for children. Uh, okay, uh, ma'am, when, when you said that uh, the, the student was scared to learn mathematics and when he moved to an app like Baiju's or any other app, uh, he found it interested. So uh, let us let us assume that I am that max teacher who was not able to create interest in in the student on my subject. So do you do you think that it is my incompetency or I have to be competitive enough along with an app? Because when I say that I am a teacher, definitely I, I I have some experience. And being a mathematics teacher, if I am not able to create an interest in the student, and an app is able to a machine is able to create an interest. Do you think that uh, it is my, is it my incompetency or or teachers should take it as it is a challenge to improve themselves, upskill themselves? Because uh, when when uh, see I, I I know virtual learning systems because our university have virtual labs, but we always say that it is only virtual. It's only virtual. It is it is it has nothing to do with the realistic thing because uh, when I show a picture of an elephant to a student or if I if I show a real elephant to a student. You know that connectivity there is some connectivity are we losing that connectivity when we depend on an app and is is the teacher becoming you know uh, in a survival mode or has the teacher need to get some improvement in the te teaching methodology because i believe that 
as a teacher i am expected to create interest in the students on the subjects which i teach so i am i am i failing in that what do you think it is not failing it is that the teacher at that time did not know that she can explore that also so she was bringing uh, uh, when a teacher was teaching measurement she was bringing uh, the scale she was bringing the protractor and other things she was bringing the measuring cylinder in the class it was not that she was not bringing but at that time uh, the animation and gamification was not there for her she has not learned that way in her school it was not taught that way so she has to upskill she has to upgrade she has to explore and she is feeling happy to do it it is not i had not seen any teacher who has not felt good after exploring something different and putting in the class and seen the result when the teacher sees the result it is not as in incompetency that she did not do it and she did not create the interest but she has now understood that my child's interest lies in something beyond that so should i go beyond that i should not limit to this because i learned this way i cannot be restricting my children to learn the same way so there is no incompetency teachers are more active nowadays they are becoming competitive each one is becoming they are in groups they are sharing information so much of information is being shared earlier it was not there there was i am the hod or i am the boss and i am the subject expert so what i am saying in the class doing is the best and you are the junior you have just joined so you learn from me it is not that the junior can also teach you something good so it's now the departmental meetings the departmental interactions so there is no incompetency the competency is coming through various ways everybody is learning and i'm seeing that happiness by learning and reproducing and then uh, getting to know that i have discovered even the child is feeling i have discovered today the children who had made those toys a toy cathon and they went to the final round they were so excited that their tools toys will be shown the games will be shown to so many other students so that's the level of satisfaction achievement which is bringing through technology through change methodology through government policies through new education policies many things are changing and i am seeing that lot of enthusiasm is there we should not uh, bring it down this enthusiasm this change try to put ourselves into that picture that how much we can put it into use and let not wait for policies and revisions to come whatever we can grasp from the nep now and it is for betterment implement it at least we can do it flexibly in our class nobody stops us cbc has no stopping for anything good learning so why we wait for government to dictate it to us let's use it happily accept the changes let the teachers be uh, trained the first thing which talks about cpg that you have to have 50 hours of training why they are saying 50 hours of minimum training and i am seeing teachers who used to travel so much go for capacity building class uh, the training cbse said you have to come here to that venue they wasted so much of time now on a click of click of a button they are doing all the trainings uh, they have got uh, diksha they have got move they have got coursera so many trainings cut 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 i get five six trainings done every day and my teacher does it in a leisure time and she sends me the certificates so it is not that they are also operating teachers are understanding that they have to adapt to a change i am not a loser i am i must not say to myself a loser i have to adopt it i have to bring the best to my classrooms and it's only pushing from the school the management and the heads that you have to keep on pushing and motivating them and training them bringing them to a vision that yes this is what is desired and things will move smoothly i i am very positive about this change uh, thank you ma'am thank you for the such an insight i just i wanted to make it challenge little bit challenging because you know then then we debate and on lot of things and it was a wonderful example that you spoke about the the uh, the toy making challenge right which will bring about creativity across the students so it was a very good example and as you rightly pointed uh, definitely that upgrading upgrading itself is very much important and uh, we have to evolve uh, as as we move ahead and especially when these kids are smarter uh, so uh, coming to devani ma'am uh, so given the situation 
the relationship between the student and the teacher or the teacher and the learner how is it that important or it is very important to maintain that social connect or emotional connect and how is it possible in this current scenario and especially when we think about the future the, the, the years to come how is it possible to cultivate that kind of an environment uh, which which will uh, you know keep the teachers as well as the students uh, encouraged throughout the course yeah thank you jatanji so uh, before i get into uh, this question i would just want to bring home to the fact that the term teacher when we talk about the term teacher when we think about this term suddenly this term only brings to the mind somebody who is very wise who has got a lot of knowledge and that some way teachers are also at the back of the mind condition to that we are transactors of knowledge right however in subconsciously the relationship between a teacher and a student ever since has had a special uh, you know a special flavor to it all this deliberation that we are talking and doing today at the hem lies the student teacher relationship now uh, when we talk about uh, a teacher we understand that teacher is not just uh, imparting knowledge somewhere she is playing a very very critical role in the emotional and social development of the child so things like mutual respect things like compassion things like am i making learning the way my student is uh, wanting to learn or uh, maybe am i encouraging my students to explore their passion is my uh, or am i uh, is my learn classrooms empowering the student and letting them face the challenge of failure or try again uh, or am i teaching them resilience so that somewhere the teacher started not all of course but by and large the role became i come to the class i impart knowledge i have to do certain pro the uh, project as and when the changes in the curriculum keep happening i need to imbibe that so teachers secondly the teachers are under a lot of pressure now all this can happen when they are liberated from the pressure of result from the pressure of marks because there's somebody sitting at the top of the hierarchy which is actually sitting there and how many 50s how many 60 percenters why not 90 plus till the time this and that has an effect on the teacher student relationship so there that is very important to understand that the student teacher relationship which for years for gen for times in memorials has been uh, the most closest bond between and a very unconditional bond but now two things are the biggest challenges in uh, which come in between the student teacher relationship changing to uh, student teacher one is the pressure of marks which the teacher already has from the hierarchs which she passes that pressure to the uh, the idea of uh, finishing the curriculum finishing the syllabus at that point of time so somewhere the relationship gets diluted now uh, again my question is we need to are uh, is the teacher letting the student explore the wrong answers and the right answers take that kind of an understanding or is the classroom environment devoid of intimidation emotional frustration because the child is probably and comparison all these things now thirdly with the press of the button the knowledge is there in front the information is there in front of the uh, student so then what is the role of the 21st century educator or the what is the role so the role is not just 
uh, a primary dispenser of knowledge, but you know, helping orchestrating uh, learning and converting information into knowledge, knowledge into wisdom. That is creating students lifelong learners. That will only happen when they both are in a space which is devoid of any kind of pressures. Of course, the structure, let the structure be there. Now with pandemic situation coming in, as it is the relationship somewhere got an interface of a screen. So the bond of respect and the, the personal touch was somewhere diluted. Now coming back, when we come back to the, uh, the new normal, come back to our classroom situation, the educators, with the 21st century educators will have to get conditioned to that education is not about the right and the wrong answer. It's actually about building a perspective. It's also about letting the student enjoy the process of learning and not just be too focused about the product that is the result. Let the student fail. Let the student understand what failure is. Let them teach them the lessons of resilience. These are, this is going to be the new bond that the educator would be able to create with the student. Uh, okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for that wonderful advice and insight. So uh, the last question in this uh, this whole round is to Kanika, ma'am. Again, uh, it is it is a debatable thing, which I want you to give uh, at least two to three takeaways for the teachers, because I think you have uh, you from your own experience the the example you cited in the previous discussion. Uh, see. to come to a curriculum mode rather than going to the syllabus mode. How is it that the teachers shall, should prepare? With the, let, us, let us assume that currently it is curriculum mode. Currently, uh, currently it is not the, the uh, syllabus mode. How is it that you think the teachers should prepare for the, for the next five years, maybe for their, for their own benefit, for their own career growth? And uh, rather than going into the, the breadth of the syllabus, how do you think that, or whether we should go into the depth of each topic, which, which is the most important thing. Secondly, uh, as you rightly pointed out, how, how is it possible or why should the teachers be a data analyst? Or how do, how do they inculcate that culture of data interpretation, understanding from the data or getting insights from the data? How should they prepare for that? And uh, let, let, me, let me put it in another way that uh, your answer has to be, a, a very good advice to the, the, the teachers, the participants attending this, uh, this, this, this discussion. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Right. Uh, I'll begin with the second uh, question first about data analysis. I think uh, we all need to, uh, the technology that we have is going to assist or collect, us collect the data. But then it is for us to decide what to do with that data. Now, if the data reveals that a particular child is pegged at a certain level and another at another level, we cannot have the same assessment for both the children. It is okay. It is not a race to be run. And in every subject, uh, the child may not be pegged at the same level. That is very important. B, I feel any data will go awry if... Uh, you know, the language of assessment and of transaction is not very clear. And here I feel language of uh, the, the communication is very, very important. A little while ago, we were talking in terms of, uh, man was talking about, you know, using these apps and creating the interest in the subject. Uh, and I myself use that example of uh, that mathematics uh, class. Uh, now, if I were to put the same thing, in a different language, which is uh, child-centric, if I might say, or child-friendly. If I were to put the same problem, as in, uh, you know, if suppose you have eight sweets in your bag and your mother puts three more sweets into your bag, how many will you have? Now that is experiential. The child can identify with that. And so the child knows the concept. The child does not know the jargon. And very often the problem with our assessments is use of jargon. And when I mark a question, uh, an answer incorrect is because it is not adhering as uh, Divyani also said, 
then my social science paper, right? So the teacher marks from here to here, this is the answer. And no other my way or the highway kind of thing. So it doesn't work like that. Has the child understood that concept? Now that that language is very, very dense for the child. Maybe for another child, it is not so dense. So we have to be very, very careful about the language we use. I know teachers use elucidate, elaborate, explain all as synonyms. They are not. So first the teacher has to understand what is the difference among these terms. And only then the child can be expected to uh, respond. A child might be able to explain it, the concept, but the child may not be able to elucidate on the concept. It is quite possible and lose out on those marks. The second, uh, the third advice that I would like to give is uh, the whole concept of zero. I feel no child should be given a zero because the child has got up, come to school, brought his bag, bought the uh, tools for attempting the exam, probably lost last two nights sleep over that. So there is some human element to that. So when I put zero, that means I'm negating the entire human effort. So it cannot be zero. And that is very, very detrimental to a child's image. Instead of writing the zero, yes, my system doesn't allow me to do anything. At least write, instead of writing zero on the paper, I can write a note instead, you know? I know you have tried. I know you could not recall, but I appreciate the effort that you made. But maybe we can meet and discuss this further. I mean, it is just that. And I'm sure that is going to be a game changer for that child. The child has heard enough from his parents, from his relatives, uh, from the peers, maybe from other teachers. So that is what is required, I feel. These apparently seem very small things, but these small things are what make the entire picture uh, for the child. I mean, from this end of the screen, I am looking at 40 children, but I am negating the individuality of that person. Here we talk about experiential learning and we talk about you know, uh, personalized learning, individualized learning. But if I'm still following this practice, it's in complete contradiction to this individualized and experiential and personalized learning. So how is it customized then? And the other thing that I would like to say finally about, uh, you know, when we are recruiting teachers or even uh, when we are taking students to become teachers for B.Ed. or uh, nursery training, whatever it might be. I think one very important component has to be the psycho-emotional component. And I, do I have, it is just not marks. Do I have the mindset to be a teacher? Why do we never test that? Not everybody can become that. I have to first have the mindset for that. And uh, that is where we are failing ourselves. We are failing uh, our children and we are failing the nation and the world. I think uh, that's all that I want to say about this matter. Uh, okay, ma'am. In fact, uh, in fact, it, it is wonderful that the, your final uh, wordings are connect, is connected with the, my next question to all of you uh, in a very, very, I want a very crisp answer to that uh, because uh, the, the entire country or the schools and uh, almost all the educational institutions are facing the same issue which you just mentioned now. And uh, when I ask my own students on how many of, how many of among you, a 60 class student, a 65 class student, how many among uh, of uh, uh, you are interested in becoming a teacher? I see maybe maximum one or two hands. And how do, how do you think that the situation can be improved? So I want to start from, uh, from the same point where, where we stopped uh, Kanika ma'am. Right. Uh, yes, because we are living in a very, very materialistic world. And uh, whether we like it or not, we like to uh, philosophize about it. And we say that, you know, teachers uh, have to be passionate and all that. But yes, then passion also needs uh, some petrol. 
So uh, therefore, uh, there needs to be, uh, we have to take care uh, that teachers are well paid, well looked after, and their own well-being should be the priority of any management, of any government. And when we have during Corona times, when we have seen teachers selling, you know, fruits on the roadside, it is very, very heart wrenching. There is nothing small about that job, but the fact is that they have been reduced to the situation. But so therefore that respect can only come when we do not, uh, you know, uh, commodify education. We have commodified education. We have uh, parent agitating. We have uh, teachers agitating. So uh, that commodification has to be taken away in the first place. And uh, the second, the respect can only come if the government gives that kind of respect. The country, if, if they become one of the highest paid people, let them go through a very, very rigorous system of selection. I'm all for that. As I said, they are as important as doctors. I mean, they are mental doctors. There are therapists, they are therapists, actually speaking. And so therefore they have to be given that their due. And if we can do that as a nation, I don't see that uh, we will have any mediocre teachers. Okay, uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so next is Devani, ma'am. What is your insight on this? Yeah. So I resonate completely with uh, Kanika's uh, thought process. The only thing I want to say is that, as you said, that when you uh, ask the batch of students of 60, how many raised the hand to become a teacher? Because somewhere, anybody and everybody feels that I qualify to be te a teacher. And often it is the work-life balance that brings in and less of passion. So for um, most of the educators, uh, it is more of a work-life balance for them rather than it goes, uh, that becomes their passion or it goes beyond the call of duty. So that is the kind, and yes, there's just one thing I want to say that every, till the teacher start respecting their own profession, their own identity, Nobody can, no government, no policy can uh, add that element to, they don't respect, they don't invest in their own growth. To here we are sitting deliberating, but how many teachers even buy the reference book with their own money? They rely on the school to give the textbooks. They rely on the school for the in-service trainings. We have to respect ourselves for the profession to be respected. So, yeah. Uh, thank you, Devani, ma'am. Uh, Ritu, ma'am, your insight on this? Sir, I would say this is the best profession to be in and we should enjoy. And uh, the next generation should be prompted to take it because uh, it is a big challenge. And uh, with the, uh, the next generation is not taking this profession as seriously. So let's all uh, join hands and say, Please promote this profession. What's a wonderful profession? And let everybody understand the dedication which is put by teachers. I feel that most of us are doing the best uh, seriously. Uh, but of course, if you are not by choice, if you are forced, then that satisfaction will never be there and you will never achieve what you want to achieve in life. So let's uh, put this forward and government should come up to promote teachers in a very, very good manner. As, as compared to earlier, I must say. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, dear panelists. So before wrapping up, I have a couple of takeaways for this session. And uh, before wrapping up, I would request Minu ma'am to uh, raise the questions posted by the participants in the chat box to the panelists. Uh, yes, Swamiji. Uh, there is this question from uh, Dr. Nair. And uh, the question is to you uh, only. And it reads, um, uh, how can we ensure that the purpose of education is meeting the purpose of life? What should we do to sensitize the students and parents? Don't you think stakeholders like industry and higher education should conduct such sessions with students and parents only without the presence of teachers? 
Uh, yeah, now uh, it is a wonderful question. So my uh, my uh, take on this or my answer to this question is, uh, it is possible only with the help of making the students aware about the realistic world. And uh, my feel is that, for example, let me let me quote my own example or my students' example, where we have a system of uh, living labs. We call it as living labs. We ask the students to go to the villages. And the students who go to the villages are actually engineers. They are expected to work in the industry. So what we do, we ask them to stay with the villages, understand the problems, and they have to solve that problem. For example, a house or a village is not having electricity, or they, do, they are not getting the, the water, or whatever natural issue they face, the societal issue they face. Engineer, engineering students are expected to understand the problem come up with their solution and try to solve that problem in the real world. So that alone will give the students an understanding about what is happening across the country or in, in, the, in their own villages and, and cities. For example, we all are facing the same issue across the country, right? Traffic jam. Or we, are, we all are in, uh, facing the same issue, pollution. So all these are issues which are faced by the country, the people for a long time. So how is it possible for us to uh, create a kind of thought process among the students? And uh, this is my, my perspective. I'm sure that the panelists will have a difference of opinion, maybe additional input because they, are, they all uh, belong to the, that, that category where uh, the teachers are considered to be the, uh, the, you know, the parents, parents of the students because the, uh, the teachers spend or students spend most of the time with teachers. So uh, I'll, I'll extend this to our other panelists also. One, two, three. Uh, All right. Should I put in something? Yeah, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes, I think uh, first I need, I really want to congratulate you on this uh, life lab that you're talking about. That's really beautiful, very interesting. It's a dream come true situation. And uh, uh, to that, I feel it, at the school level, it should be mandatory. Uh, it is there in NEP also. Uh, it, is be, it should be mandatory to have a community outreach program for every student. And in, uh, you know, uh, in a very genuine way, not again, it's not just lip service, just not on paper. But, and due credit should be given. And uh, uh, you talked a little uh, about foreign universities, where they're very insistent about our engagement with the society. And I know lots of students coming back and asking for these recommendations. And I've always said that I'm not going to do it because I'm not going to lose my credibility by writing something which never happened. And uh, so, but subsequent to that, that inspired me to start off a system where, uh, you know, we had our uh, economically uh, underprivileged uh, students staying back. And I uh, told my class 11, 12 students that you have to stay on after school hours for twice a week. And you have to give in at least 30 hours to mentoring these children. And if you come fulfill those 30 hours, I'll give you the certificate. Now, the intention may not have been, uh, I mean, uh, that uh, lofty of the child, but willy-nilly the child did it. And, but, and I know that there has been some connect. So we can do these things. Uh, and uh, same thing with the industry. Uh, uh, what Dr. Nair has said, I feel that uh, at school level, it should be the community outreach. Maybe at the higher education level, it should be an industry uh, link where they really get to check out the kind of professions that would, they would like to pursue and the kind of skill sets that are required. Uh, I would like to add that uh, the school has already promoted, our school has already promoted uh, interact club activities where the child doesn't have to do an activity because he wants the recommendation. It starts from the primary class. These children are doing this uh, project Buniyad where they are teaching the underprivileged children right from primary class. They are doing outreach programs because they are a part of Interact Club. These human values are not to be done when they are <coughs> passing out or when they want recommendations. They are done in the school because they learn 
these values as they grow so by the end of the 12 years they have so much accumulated outreach programs and interactive activities and these uh, projects that we don't have to think at least it goes half a page when we just sit and write because we don't have to thought process everything is done so each child has been given those grades right from primary to senior so this we should not inculcate that I, as you are leaving you need something so you do it no you do it because it's a part of your learning in school so it has to be uh, drilled from lower classes and it will bring build your portfolio in 12 years so good so these club activities are to be done seriously to be taken by children seriously and by schools right from primary so then it will flow very easily and there will be no bridge which has to be uh, no gap which has to be bridged later on in life okay uh, so minimum, i would say, yeah yes devini ma'am i would just want to add one thing that uh, ever since sign in, in memorial and uh, uh, g uh, krishnamurthy says that what is the purpose of education but preparing a person or an individual for life so um, now how do you prepare because most of the time the schools are in a rush to uh, finish the syllabus and so these are the small uh, opportunities where the child is uh, encouraged to go beyond his classrooms and contribute to uh, the society and i think uh what kanika said was extremely uh, did was extremely uh, good that she said that she will because most of the universities do ask for these outreach programs because they want the child to be compassionate and sensitive towards the outside world what the society is in real life so that is an effort which uh, and any new education policy does talk about internships and uh, such kinds of projects to be taken but they should not be limited to project file they should be real life projects so yes if we want our children to be uh, you know well groomed out personalities who have a good sense of society and we want to mitigate the crisis which we see around us we need to expose them to social uh, scenario Okay. i just uh, want to yes, add one more thing here yes uh, yes, yes ma'am uh, this is uh, right uh, i mean what ritu ma'am said and what devyani said right uh, yes uh, there is this effort at creating this sensitivity right right from the beginning but i would also like to know that as schools are we uh, uh, you know uh, not are holding back a child's promotion because the child has not Uh, is a bully for example or has been very violent have we given it its due importance i mean it is all very good to um, uh, you know implement these uh, practices but then i want to know what is the corrective measure that we are taking so uh, that is something uh, which i feel which is worth pondering that if we really want to bring in humane uh, education systems and bring up humane children then we have to make these things uh, matter or to be conveyed in a language that everybody understands and unfortunately everybody understands the language of marx so when uh, and the moment you attach marx it becomes very very significant so am i holding back uh, uh, a child on these grounds i don't know of any school that is doing it then in fact uh, that is what thank you yeah in fact what you said was i was thinking that there why is there not a report card which tests the uh, you know the human factor in a child which grades him whether because you spoke about bullyism and that is one of the major issues because you've spoken that it is there so why do we i restrict our report cards to marks or grades why isn't there a report card for a development uh, overall development of the child where his 
human, not just the IQ, but as EQ and human factor is also assessed. So, so yes, uh, these are the issues that we need to kind of ponder over and integrate them into our system. So, in fact, uh, what Kanika ma'am uh, told is right. Um, see, it is we are uh, definitely holding back. I too feel so. And uh, the system has to evolve in such a way that uh, we are too flexible to implement these kind of practices and it might take a long time uh, so before before wrapping up let let me just uh, you know pull down the takeaways and uh, there are there are five to six points which i wanted to emphasize on uh, which which has evolved out of this session and uh, let me let me thank you all for the the sincere cooperation because i was a little debative in between and I wanted to bring in, you know, the other side of the question also. That is why uh, I created a situation where, uh, you know, we debate each other uh, so that it is more interesting. And I realized that uh, the at the end, when we when we come out with our own opinions, it was totally interesting. Okay, first thing is that uh, one is one is as Ritu ma'am suggested, technology has to be taken as a tool. And uh, from from a technological point of view, I strongly believe that. There are still teachers fearing about the online classes, whether the, the teaching job will uh, or the technology will take away the te teaching job. Definitely not. It is not possible. Even the survey by the BBC says that uh, the elementary schooling, uh, the school teachers and the high school teachers job will, is the least affected job, even if the, there is a technological advancement. The second is, uh, uh, as we all agree, uh, we our teachers have become more and more flexible. and this is going to be a ground or this is going to be a, 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 an opportunity where even there is a drastic change in the implementation of the NEP. Uh, our teachers are now ready to accept that change because we have we have changed a lot because of the unprecedented and unexpected situation that was created by the, the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, the third, third thing is, I feel um, as, as rightly pointed out by Kanika ma'am, and I used to practice whatever you said. Uh, the important thing is that let us not stick on to the topics in syllabus. Let us make out or let us think, uh, let us start thinking about the curriculum perspective rather than sticking on to the syllabus. Because if I, I strongly believe that it can be practiced. And if we think from that point of view, we can easily cover the syllabus already laid down by the authorities. And there is no harm in thinking beyond. There is no harm in think, uh, thinking or implementing or coming out with more and more topics covering the breadth and depth of the, the subject. So that over a period of the time, the teacher herself or himself becomes so competent. The fourth thing is data analytics. Uh, one of the most important and interesting things uh, that has come out of this session, uh, which is totally different from or uh, separated, but it needs to be integrated from this session. Uh, I feel that teachers should start, uh, especially looking out for the tools. There are a lot of tools. One of the best tools is Excel, nothing, nothing beyond Excel. So uh, teachers should start practicing on how uh, they can uh, make use of the tools like Excel. And, uh, and finally, uh, as, as we all agreed, uh, we should always promote the students to be teachers. And uh, at the same time, uh, as rightly pointed by, by Kanika ma'am and we all agree to that. They should have that mindset. So how do you bring or how do you create a situation? How, how do we make sure that the students come out with that kind of a mindset? So let us start debating and let us start exploring. And uh, thank you all the panelists. Thank you all the participants for the patient listening. Uh, I feel that the, the whole one and a half hours was uh, much more interesting and enriching. And uh, we, we hopefully we will, we will see again and I feel uh, over, over a period of time, uh, we will have a lot of deliberations, a lot of discussions, and uh, definitely there will be some outcome uh, from these discussions. We will come out with some kind of a valuable output. And let me, let me uh, invite now Devani ma'am, who was instrumental in pulling this out. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so... Uh... Thank you, everyone. Kind of at the bottom of uh, my heart, I thank everyone on behalf of both Amrita Vishwavidya Peter and Edudez. And I think that's a project that we both came together and deliberated. And we thought that 
here sitting we, uh, in Delhi NCR and tier one cities, we talk about new education policy. And uh, I also happen to uh, interact, uh, have interacted with a number of uh, educators and principals in the tier three cities, and they were completely uh, oblivious, except for uh, listening, uh, you know, listening to the uh, that the policy is there, but they were not aware of what are, or probably they didn't get the time. So we jointly thought to come up with uh, an initiative where we could take up various, uh, you know, uh, concepts and just deliberate on it. And uh, this has been one of very fruitful uh, webinars. And I could see the kind of rich discussion that happened. I aim with this that yes, uh, classroom situation will change dynamically with the integration of technology, with the newer perspectives that the world is throwing at us, with the changing teacher-student relationships and the demand of the society. But uh, we all need to understand that uh, we all have to work towards mitigating the crisis that we see around us and Educate, no other uh, forum than education is the better, best way where we could, uh, you know, work towards reducing the crisis that we see in uh, the society and hoping to create a very meaningful education system for our nation. Uh, I thank everyone uh, to have graced this forum. Thank you so much. A special thanks to uh, Dr. Nair, because I was reading the comments and I think he's created a corpus of, uh, you know, content. I, I mean, I'm the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much, Dr. Nair. It was so enriching. Your comments were very enriching. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chaitanya Ji. Thank you, Thank Kanika. you, ma'am. Thank, thank you, Meenu, ma'am, also. Uh, thank you, Kanika, ma'am. Thank you, Ritu, ma'am. Thank you, all the participants. Have a wonderful thank day and weekend ahead. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much.